Okay, so there are two things we need to be clear about here. First of all, Get you, you thought of this as some new age vegan gluten free office nonsense until you decided that you actually like new age vegan gluten free <laughs> nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> well, he did you move to California. Yes, so let's. This is Bad Voltage, and this time on Bad Voltage, an interesting thing has happened. Brian, our very own Brian Lundu, has had a child. Hell yes, yes. I have. Fantastic. So yeah, first of all, we should hey, say congratulations. Hey, hey. Thank well done, you, good, good sirs. My, my child, as of this recording, is eight and a half days old, and I've managed to wow. keep him alive the entire time. So I'm going to count that as a parenting <laughs> win. Genuinely How has the other child responded to the new child? Uh, actually, she's been pretty great. So I've got okay. a four and a half year old daughter. It's minor digression. I've got a four and a half year old daughter who's always been daddy's little girl, right? We hang out together. We play video games together. We're, 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 she's a very nerdy little girl already. And we just love hanging out together. Lead in the days leading up to my child's birth. All of a sudden, her stance changes. She approaches me one day and informs me that mommy is her favorite. She loves her most. She refused to give daddy hugs and kisses for like three weeks. She basically gave me the cold shoulder. I think she was kind of thinking, oh, a new baby's on the way. I better butter up to mommy because mommy's going to be busy with baby. And uh, so, yeah, so daddy has been, um, you know, daddy's all right. Daddy's all right. But just yesterday, no, I'm isn't. bringing this up. Because it was weighing heavily on this poor daddy's heart. Uh, my daughter finally decided, oh, okay, daddy's cool again and we can hang out again. But seriously, for three friggin' weeks, mommy is my favorite daddy. Holy God in hell. That cuts right down to your heart like you would not expect it to. But that is the only thing that has been a problem. Like she hasn't done any like acting out because of like attention for the baby or anything. She just gave daddy a friggin' hard time. So not so bad. <laughs> I, I, overall. I got a bit that's stone cold me on the part of the kid <laughs> and it was I mean, calculated that's... man you could see it in her eyes and you could see that she kind of felt bad about doing it so she kind of started to stop doing it after a while but yeah. she she did oh, it just man. the same i tell you this what this is just the, this is she's gonna be the hardest 16 year old ever when she gets to that point yeah. it's gonna be brutal <laughs> You you just you yeah. just wait, pal. Oh, I know you know. Dude. <laughs> Speaking of someone with a fifteen-year-old daughter, oh, yeah. um, but importantly, anyway. um, new life has been brought into the world in the shape of a miniature Lunduk, and so life has to leave the world, and so our very own John O'Bacon is here, shores us dying. I am feeling quite sick today, so uh, <laughs> yeah, so. Ignore my uh, wretches. <laughs> so yes, we are we are maintaining the cosmic illness balance where there, can, there yeah, has to be a certain it, amount of illness in the world all at once. Of course, that would be fixed if people were allowed to vaccinate their should, children. Should we whatever. should we write um, Save <laughs> Jono on like a water tower in town or something for him? It's the circle of life, uh, you know. So life has started and life is old because we're on our fiftieth show. We are, uh, so we're getting old a little bit, yeah. hence feeling sick, but. Because we're at our 50th show, 50 show we've got to, you've got to keep things fresh and interesting. So we've actually got a two-part segment series in, in today's show. And the first part is going to be about the Mycroft artificial intelligence debris that just recent, recently got funded on Kickstarter. We're going to get into that and what it's all about. And then we're going to interview Chris Wade, who has been making noise recently about the new proposed FCC law that is going to basically lock down wireless and make all of our lives suck a whole bunch. And then I'm going to continue the new Hack Voltage series and talk about Android Mirror. Jono has bought basically a box for $150 on which his laptop is balanced, <laughs> and he'll be talking about it. Actually, no, it's, it's, it's a standing desk, and he's going to tell us how it works. It's not a standing desk. And then part two. <laughs> part two in our two-part series, we, uh, uh, having started discussing Mycroft, we're then going to get into the wider topic of home automation. Uh, what, what's interesting about it, what's not interesting about it, how much we care about it, and where open source fits into it as well. And now, Bad Voltage. So the Mycroft Kickstarter is now finished and is fully funded. For people who don't know, Mycroft is 
Mycroft is basically like, you know, uh, Siri or Cortana or Google now, but it's a little device that sits in your house. It's the Amazon Echo. This is, it's, it's an open so it's source Amazon, Amazon, Amazon Echo. Echo with a face on the front. That's, that's a good way of describing it. But it's, uh, it's all open source, right? So it sits there in your house, listens to you say Mycroft, whatever, and then processes that and then speaks back to you. So Amazon Echo. But the nice thing about this is, uh, the software on it's going to be open source. It, it's, um, it, at the moment, their plan is that it will send off stuff to the cloud for recognition, but there'll be multiple cloud backends. All their backend is going to be open source. They are working with the community to try and put, try and do on device speech recognition. Um, they're allowing people to submit in an open source way, um, new things for Microsoft to do. They call them skills, you know, new things that it can recognize and whatever. They're, um, they're working to control the Linux desktop and they hit a stretch goal to do that. Awesome. Incredibly open projects and everything. Basically, there's nothing at all wrong with it, and it's exactly the kind of project we want to <laughs> say. <laughs> Controversial right. segment now comes to a close. <laughs> Speak. I seem to remember in the last in the last show, you, Mister Language, was was somewhat cynical. I was, I was, what I changed? was somewhat cynical, but I've now, I've now so spent I do have money a quick question. But before we get started <laughs> discussing the Minecraft, is I missed out on the Kickstarter at ninety nine dollars. Of those other three of you, who actually did back this? Just out of curiosity, then we can discuss it. I backed it. I did. I backed. I I, backed two, I, I, I did not. I I was planning okay. to. I actually had funds in my PayPal account with my PayPal card. I was going to plop it down on it, and then I had a child, and I totally forgot to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so we're we're two and you two and two. Right. So yeah. Well, and also also Jeremy, they've <coughs> they've kicked off a um they've kicked off a an Indiegogo campaign. Yeah, but you. So I was going to back it on Kickstarter half because I knew I thought all three of you were and, and Brian will be excused for having a child. That's a pretty legitimate excuse <laughs> I, I, if there ever I was. I appreciate one. that my but excuse. I think since why, all yeah, three of you are getting it, if we did a group review, we'd all have it at the same time. The Indiegogo doesn't ship till later and it's a different price point. So for 99 bucks I was going to get it just to review it with you guys for 150 that, and later yeah. it's I, I, less I have to say yeah. the the fact that they've got onto Indiegogo now I understand that they want to say to people look okay you missed the Kickstarter but you still want to buy one of these so go ahead and do this and I think it's perfectly fair that it's at a higher price point because you know you missed the Kickstarter so fuck you customer you're not an investor you're a customer but right. it's weird they're doing it on Indiegogo because what they're basically doing is using Indiegogo as a as a pre-ordering yeah, platform. Yeah, it's a pre-order That's platform. not what it, it is. It actually says it's a, pre-order. Yeah. Yeah, it actually makes Indiegogo a lot of sense is not for me. that. It's for crowdfunding. So it looks a <laughs> bit like, you, you know, like they're on Indiegogo way. It looks like they're trying to raise more money to do more well, stuff. Well, they kind of are. I mean, that's what a pre-order is. You're, re- <laughs> you're like when you pre-order yeah, a video game, you're paying the company before they actually manufacture yeah, the game so they know you can, you can how pre-order. much roughly they need to produce. And it allows them to actually produce at a lower cost. So it, it does kind of make sense. Oh, yeah, you but it's a different with vibe. PayPal, though. What? You could pre you could pre-order it with PayPal. All right, so without debating yeah, how they're yeah. using Indiegogo, which yeah, is a anyway, I, I thought topic. that was. I weird. very much agree with your sentiment. People use Indi- Indiegogo idiotically, but that's that's that segment in and of itself. Yeah. So the, the one, do any of you guys have a Echo? No, no, no. Okay, our neighbors bought one, but I haven't seen them. So use I think yet, the really so. cool thing about the Mycroft, is, especially from the perspective of the four of us on the show, is that it really is a very open device, right? The device itself, right. it looks like it's just going to be a Raspberry Pi 2 uh, with some Arduino stuff bolted on top. Yeah. The, like you said, the server is going to be open source. The client's going to be open source. Pretty much all of it is going to be open, which really sets it apart from any other device that I know of. Because this is getting to be a very crowded space, right? Just on Kickstarter, there's a whole bunch of them, the OB, the Ivy, Sleek. There are so many of them that I stopped looking. Um, you know, so th- you have one entrenched one in the in the Echo which is could not be more closed and locks you into Amazon's ecosystem and is much less interesting, I think, because of that. And the, you have some middlingly open ones like the Ubi and the, and the Sleek. And then you have this, which is the only one I've seen that's totally open. So I think that's really cool. And I think it's even more than open. The, the thing you just said, Jeremy, is what got me interested in this. It is. It's a Raspberry Pi 2 with a bunch of Arduino stuff bolted on top. This thing feels like a really cool maker project that a couple of guys yes. were working on. And they were like, you know what? This is rad. Let's make a shit ton of them and sell them. And not, I love Not that. only does it feel like that, um, you know how it came about. 
that actually is Yo, precisely how I, it came that's about. That's what I'm saying. It's, it's, uh, it's inspiring yeah. to see that people are doing this, that are, they're grabbing all of these off-the-shelf components and building something that's kind of friggin' rad. It, whether it's commercially yeah. successful or not, who, who knows, right? But it's friggin' rad that they built it and that the community is rallying behind it because technically, based on what they're building this on, the four of us could probably get together and if we had the software, build a couple of custom-made ones pretty much ourselves. And, and yeah, but- I think it's rad that they're doing it and it's inspiring that it might inspire other people to do more of the same thing to grab a pie to grab a banana pie to grab a bunch of arduino kits and try and ship more cool very weird devices i think it's just just awesome yeah you just need to make sure that you're not a a child b called muhammad and c take Uh, to to show your friends yeah that is wow (laughs) holy that's the worst thing like on the other hand though did you see obama's tweet about it no I did. That was what brilliant. Was, Obama what has was tweet, President Obama Obama's has, official 140 character Twitter tweet about this? His 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 official tweet reads: um, "Cool clock, Ahmed. Want to bring it to the White House? We should inspire more kids like you to like science. It's what make America great." Great. Did President Obama get the kid out of jail um, and fix it uh, for him because he re- has the uh, ability to? Simultaneously, really supportive. Kids um, not in jail. Two massive fingers up. To the people of Irving, so no, well you know done. what I mean. Like ah. anyway, meanwhile, meanwhile, back at the point. Um, <laughs> yeah, so back. The, like, like like you guys, the thing I the thing I love about the Mycroft and the the reason why I supported it was was really frankly, it's less about what it actually is; it's what it stands for. Yeah, um, like the artificial intelligence thing is awesome, and that's great, and that's cool. I don't really need something like that in my in my life. I spend most of my time if I need to look something up by voice, I tend to use my phone to do that. But I just love the sentiment of completely open source, completely yeah. open hardware. I love I, the, the way they've gone about it. I would agree yeah, with you. It's, and it's like, it's, I, for me, it's, it's about inspiring other people to do the same thing, is that showing that this is the way you can do it. You can be successful on Kickstarter with, with these kinds of projects. I am yes. reasonably I confident it's, it's cool. that I've spent $119 on a thing which I'm going to use to say, Mycroft, in 25 minutes, remind me to take the chicken out of the oven, and that's all I use it for after the first two weeks of being excited by it. But, <laughs> the world's best kitchen timer. Nice. Yeah, but... So that is a broader phone, question, though. Do you think devices like this are, are generally, genuinely interesting? I... I, I, I honestly don't know. I, I don't use... Um, I have. We, we all have it. I got a phone, apart from Brian. Um, so you've got Google Now on there. And what do you actually use that for? I know some I've people... never they, used it once. They do this kind of thing all the time. No, they send text now. messages and dictate emails and do searches and everything. And me, I use Google Now for everything. The voice really? part of it, though? All the time. You speak yeah, to I mean, I, Yeah, the voice part. I'll, I'll, I'll take my phone. I'll say, okay, Google, navigate to wherever I'm going. Or I'll be, what time does this particular store open? Really? Or um, call this particular person. I use it all the time. I don't use it for dictating emails or or, or text messages or anything like that. Because invariably gets it mostly right, but not all the way right. But for, for calling up information, I use it all the time. So you'd use this all the time, right? Because it's just listening. Um, whenever you want to, you just stick it in the kitchen or whatever, or in your office, yeah, I, and just say I, yeah, stuff. I think I, that's brilliant. Yeah, I think, I think the, I think I'm a lot more convinced by the voice stuff than I used to be. I remember when Erica got her, she she got an iPhone a couple of years ago. She moved over from Android, and Siri was fun, but it was a toy, and it it didn't work a lot of the time, and it didn't know a lot of the stuff. We did a side by side. Her and I did a side by side comparison of Siri and Google Now, and Google Now just absolutely slams Siri because you can say to Google, like, "Okay, Google, who's the lead singer in Iron Maiden?" and it'll tell you the last three lead singers and things like that. The level of articulation within within the Google services is great. You don't have that with Siri. My concern for the Mycroft is that it will be more like Siri, but not as good because it doesn't have that service integration. Well, and I noticed so they don't fine. really have an NLP person that I saw involved, which does make me a, a little bit nervous in that regard but that's a fixable there, uh, there's um 
there are a couple of people who are sort of tied into that. But yeah, I don't think there's anyone necessarily dedicated but, but to that, again, and that's a good point. Open. I think they imagine that. I mean, yeah. the, the, the community can get involved with this. Other companies could get involved with this. Companies who want to provide services for this could get involved with this. I mean, there's nothing, at least from my point of view, I, that would stop, say, Amazon from coming in and producing a service for this where you could tie this into Amazon Prime and their music streaming and their voice recognition stuff that works on Echo for maybe a monthly fee well, or the, something i mean it's that's the that's challenge the beauty is of a be, platform like this the challenge and i'm not an expert on this but we've there's been some discussions in x prize about how this relates to uh, to one of our prizes the challenge is going to be in terms of, i think a, a significant chunk of this is going to be the voice recognition because there isn't a a large freely available speech course no, that's, true. that's available but that is also something that i think can be easily uh, well, it's another crowdsourced. fixable problem. The, this is, um, uh, as you know from the discussion we had before, my, one of my big concerns about it was that you say Mycroft something and it ships the something off to the internet to be recognised. Right. And I complained about it. And Ryan Sipes, who's, you know, CEO of the project, um, was really interested in being involved in a conversation about that and said, yeah, um, we, we, ideally we'd love to do all the recognition on the device, but Pocky Sphinx is not very good at this. Julius needs to be right. trained. Um, and we we want to be able to do recognition on the device, but it's not good enough. I said, okay, fine. So I understand you're shipping it out to services in order to get this done. But why not work on getting it done on the device? And he's like, yeah, absolutely. We totally, totally plan to do that. So it's not that they're looking to steal your stuff. It's like, this is the only viable alternative. We want to work on another viable yeah, alternative. And it is. At, the, at and this you, particular time, it is, I believe. Here is a question, well, here the, is a question is, for you. Imagine that Mycroft recorded everything that you say and kept it at mycroft.com in order to build up that huge voice corpus. Now, there are some people as long as who it was say, well, old. great, because, because that's, um, that's moving towards a great idea. Um, <laughs> it builds up that voice corpus in order that we can free ourselves from proprietary upstream services. There are a whole bunch of other people who say, no, 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 it has to be opt-in, because otherwise it it's a terrible privacy violation. Yeah, it absolutely but if it's opt-in, has to be no opt-in. one will turn it on. It has to be. The, but in, in that case, they won't build up that huge voice call. You, you can't, no, but, but you uh, can't build a product built on it, open so. source and open ideals and freedom and then have it do that by default. Why? It would have to be Why? opt-in on principle. It would have to be opt-in. It's, it's, I completely disagree with you. Um, you say, I think it's got to be opt-in. No, you say, we do this. This The reason we're doing it is this. This is the software we use to process it. This is where it's all stored. You, you, know, you, know, you can make a very strong pitch archive, at the beginning right? with a giant opt-in button, and I would have no problem at all with yep. that. But to None. make it opt-in I would by opt in. default is just... I would absolutely opt-in if John it was I leave my taxes on the front optional, door in front of my drop cam even thinks it should be dropped, opt-in. It, it should be opt-in. <laughs> No, uh, you see, it's no. I mean, I think the th- the thing is, is that it, uh, and this is something I think I learnt through the Unity Scopes experience, <laughs> is which was precisely the same kind of thing. Is yeah, you've got to have it, you've got to have it opt in. I mean, I get the point of yep. If you if you have it opt in, far few people will use it. But at the end of the day, it's much harder to to to. to it's re- much harder to regain trust than to build trust. No, but Agreed. And you, to build trust, it, it has to thing. be opt-in. You yeah. say, people are like, well, why the hell is it shipping all my stuff off the internet? You say, because we haven't got a big enough voice corpus. They go, why can't you get a big enough voice corpus? And you say, because you won't let us provide voices. No, right? but, the way, no that's, but that's not the way you need to do it. The way, the way you do it is you set up a website where you basically ask people from all over the world to go and read a set piece of text using a and there's a little javascript record button and that yep. will record the audio oh yeah and you upload that to the site that's, that's a brilliant so, idea. you build the speech corpus you don't need so, the device so itself john to the, the, the largest open source corpus at the moment is librivox yeah. right which is, yeah, um, is people right. reading um uh, out of copyright books so sherlock holmes books and things like that sort of thing project gutenberg does how many chapters of librivox have you recorded as someone who's invested in this and wants to see this fixed but you're conflating no, two unrelated no, issues no. there i'm not invested in this first of all uh you know and uh, yes you, you want there to be you want there to be a large open source corpus so we don't have to use proprietary speech recognition no, services I'm, you're just not invested yes, in I, enough yes. to do anything about it this is my point yes precisely okay that, but, okay. If, okay. but if you say no, okay John's, you have John's a right, Stuart, then we Stuart, pick this stuff up Stuart, john was right john. about this there you are there's you're two wrong. separate things one you're you're right about one thing Stuart. the libra fox side of things it hasn't been 
in my opinion, anywhere near as successful as it could be because they suck at getting the word out. Now, just because they <laughs> suck at telling people and motivating people to do something doesn't mean that all the time, every option will suck, and we have to force people to do it. Um, I think if the Mycroft folks, say, partnered up with the LibreFox folks, created a series of yeah, press releases, exactly. put out a couple of videos, put up a, a simple website, just like Jono said, where, like, push the button and read this text, and, you know, it, it's basic, and then push this button to tweet that I helped make, you know, speech recognition free, I think it would be a right. rousing success. I would write an article about it. I know at least a half dozen other tech writers that would write an article about it and it would do a wonderfully yeah. well job i think i think it would be great i think it would be absolutely great and what's what what's cool about that as well is i would say that well, the one thing that i think mycroft of of <coughs> i think they've got some great they've got some good visibility right now and i think that's partially down to them because they've they've articulated an interesting product idea but i think it's also because artificial intelligence and the open hardware open software nature of this has really captivated people's minds yeah most I'd, I'd imagine that there's uh, more people know about Mycroft than uh, than LibriVox, for example. So Mycroft could actually really help improve LibriVox in that way. Yes, um, and then solve the problem. But yeah, you don't need to ship it all off to the original service. Uh, it's got to be opt in. Yeah. It's got to be opt in. Yeah, but, let's not pull a canonical um, here. So, so yeah, so <laughs> because and actually, I cannot believe that neither of you mentioned that this thing runs snappy. By the way, speaking of canonical, because I don't care. Because I, 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 do, I, I care about the phone. I do I really want this to succeed. And, and, well, so it runs Ubuntu. I like the phone. Um, I do really want this thing to succeed, succeed, and I think I do have some concerns that it will. In that the release date's almost a year away. And you yeah. have to wonder, from a functionality perspective, where will something like the Echo be in a year? And how far behind will the Mycroft be? So the openness uh, well, of it certainly appeals to me a ton. But uh, from a mass market I adoption don't. perspective, less so, I think. So I don't think that's I, a I'm a little bit thing. concerned um, The point that John I made a couple of moments ago, I mean, look at where Siri was a year ago as opposed to now. And the answer is roughly where it is now. Yeah. The idea of having oh, a but thing if you look at how fast they're, they're iterating on the Echo product, it's they release oh, yeah, it's a lot fast. of functionality. It's fast. Very, no, no, yeah. Jeremy's Jeremy's right about that. But here's why I'm not concerned. Do you guys remember in the '90s those little Tamagotchi things, those little keychain and you know, yeah. play animal oh, yeah. things? Yeah. Those were the most retarded little things that had no real functionality, no real memory, and never really did squat. But they were friggin' adorable, and they sold like hotcakes. There was better, fancier things that were just kind of like that, that had tons of functionality that never did all that well. In my mind, I'm looking at what they did with the Mycroft thing. This thing is a adorable it's adorable and people are going to like the adorable nature of it so not only is it open source open hardware adorable and community driven it's got all these buzzwords around it but the thing is it's adorable and the echo and everything else feels utilitarian by comparison i, I just don't think it's going to be an issue there is there is though i think one big risk that they face much as we've we've we're all singing their praises for the open hardware open services open uh, yeah. source aspect of this <clears throat> there is one major risk that they face in the next year though is that the more openness you bake into a product the more of an opportunity there is for uh, for bureaucracy and elongated yeah. decision making, yeah. like sure. when everything is open, you're inviting hundreds of opinions from all over the world. Some of which will be solicited, some of which will be unsolicited. But that's the and that same. Slow that's everything the same down. thing we we would say about say Firefox. I mean, so should we say no, the LibreOffice and but, Firefox should never no, exist but, and can't possibly success be no, successful no, 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 because I, there might be bureaucracy? No, not at all. What I'm what no what I'm what I'm saying is that invariably with a lot of hardware products that aren't open. Um, the company defines what the hardware is and therefore the, the the way in which other people can engage is at a more limited level because it's by definition running on a on a closed system because they're open hardware and open source if they manage it well if they manage their community well and and they stay focused on their goals and they move it forward that this won't be an issue at all but that's going to require some pretty hefty organizational skills within Mycroft and I don't know them well enough to say whether that will or won't happen it's just it's just a risk starting to now think that this is John O. Pitching his consulting <laughs> I know <laughs> I was just going to say hey right the same great reasonable week. rates all major credit cards accepted just call yeah. this number because <laughs> they've got you know loads of money call 1-800-JONO <laughs> 1-800-JONO <laughs> 
<laughs> we should have that. We should have that. So we we should probably wrap this up. This is part one of an exciting two part discussion in this show. So we've talked about Mycroft, which is you know we're all big fans. We all love it to bits, despite some people, some uneducated, red headed individuals, <laughs> chastising the project through a lack of information in the previous episode and now turning it around when he, you know, actually read the fucking website. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so now we're going to, later in the show, we're going to talk about the wider picture, which is home automation, which we, we touched on in the last show. People seem, on the forum seem pretty excited about it. So stay tuned later in the show for part two. we have with us christopher wade from with think penguin and he contacted me via uh, dan from tlts about a recent fcc wireless issue uh, so i'm just going to read real quick part of what he sent me to to get him on the show and then for those of you who maybe aren't familiar with what's exactly going on here i'll give a very brief explanation then we'll turn it over to chris and the rest of the guys for for a little q a here so uh, what chris sent me was we're trying to get publicity for a campaign to stop fcc rules which will essentially ban linux gnu and free software the rules basically require manufacturers of devices with wi-fi in them to lock the devices down it'll impact everything from laptops desktops routers cell phones wi-fi cards bluetooth and more the reason is that they all contain software-defined radios which basically means that the os can control the parameters of the Wi-Fi chips to operate beyond FCC certified spec. The rules governing spectrum use make sense, or we'd all be interfering with each other, and that's bad, but the rule changes are not acceptable. So now, for those of you who aren't really super familiar with how the FCC works, this is what's called an MPRM, which is a Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, and it's basically kind of a comment period where the FCC allows you to discuss potential rule changes that are in the pipeline. This one, as you may imagine, has gotten quite a few comments, and like Chris mentioned in that email, it is important to note here that the FCC's motivations are primarily safety, and the impetus for this was that the FAA found some illegally modified equipment operating in the unlicensed band, and that was interfering with what other stations at uh, a couple of airports. So I, I think what we have here probably is a sloppily worded uh, but not finalized uh, wording, which I, the, the uh, who was it? The Stanford lawyer, Jonathan Mayer, said, quote unquote, shitty wording during a conversation about potential rules does not automatically equate to shitty rules. And the FCC, I think, has clarified their position <laughs> from a motivation perspective. And this is a quote from the FCC. Our position is that the versions of this open source software can be used as long as they do not add the functionality to modify the underlying operating characteristics of the RF parameters. Now, I think most people's concern here is that OEMs have roundly and widely shown that they will take the easiest and cheapest method of compliance, and that is possibly to lock down firmware. So, uh, Chris, would you say that's a pretty good short intro, and uh, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, no, it, it's, a, it's a very good assessment. Um, the, it, it, it's, 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 um, so so some, of, some of what, uh, the, the way I kind of read the um, a part of that quote from the FCC um, was, it was, it was a bit of double speak there. Um, basically, the FCC is saying uh, they only care about, you know, one thing, but the reality is in order to comply with the rules, manufacturers have to do another thing, which ultimately means, uh, and that other, that, that other thing to comply with the rules is what we don't want to have happen, which is locking, locking stuff down. Um, so you know, it, it it basically doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter what they want, even if they only want uh, to prevent um, uh, you know uh, prevent interference um, because of the, the way the rules are worded and the reaction um, of manufacturers on how they're going to deal with that. Um, it, it's going to it's going to result in it's going to result in problems for for end users and and everybody who wants to uh, you know have control over their own devices. Um, the the software defined um, radio chips are controlled by uh, the, basically by the operating system. They're not um, they're not like separate chips. So it's not, um, and it's they're not like uh, think the way they used to be several years ago, where um, the the OS didn't have control over those pieces because either they were in hardware or maybe they were. Um, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I guess basically you could just say they were in hardware. Um, let's not go so, into too much detail. I'm not actually um, an engineer. Um, I'm only wor- I'm only working with engineers 
who are right. uh, more, more savvy in describing this, but but that's that's basically what they've they've gone and said. So, so. quick quick question, <clears throat> um, a bit of a devil's advocate question is: Let's assume for a second that the FCC, like these these restrictions as they were originally announced, happen, and and that's the new world that we live in. What's the worst thing that's going to happen here? I mean, what what is what situation are you working to prevent that will impact just regular consumers? I, I I'm not talking about Linux hackers who want to uh, be able to hack any part of the stack. Like, what do you think is going to be the negative impact on my mum and dad who buy a Linksys router and uh, and they have to live in this new world? Well, okay, so I mean. <laughs> There's there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, negatives as far as impacting regular users that you know they never flash their own routers or install their own operating systems. Um, so wait, there are people that don't flash their routers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> weird, eh? Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> freaky. Scary thought, but yes. <laughs> um, so. Uh, basically, uh, there, there's a lot of innovation, or pretty much all the innovation really um, comes out of. Uh, it doesn't really come out of industry. It comes. It comes out of the software development uh, community who are working on projects um, on their own time, um, and you know, working towards improvements. And you know, they're working in communities. Um, hang, hang on, hang on a wait second. Wait a minute. Just, just, just on that point, are you, you're saying that innovation does not come out of industry. Um, well, let's see, I, I, I should be careful. So what, what I'm trying to say is... Yeah, you should. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't want to say... I mean, okay, so a lot of the... Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me be a little bit more careful. In this, yeah, take, take two seconds, back up, reset, and go for it, man. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, so, <laughs> Full step. So what I'm, trying to, what I'm trying to say is basically things like um, um, buffer blow. Buffer blow is something that is uh, uh, basically it has to do with uh, latency, and um, in, in order to uh, there, there's algorithms that um, basically have been used for for a long time, and they're they're not giving us um, the the ideal uh, or, or or lower latency as low of a latency as we, we can get with our uh, devices, um, but. Buffer bloat was developed and tested on um, a fork of OpenWRT, um, which um, wouldn't be possible if we didn't have access and control of our devices. Um, so it's, it's these types of things that um, come out of, and this wasn't something that was developed by, um, uh, you know, the major manufacturers. This is something that came out of... Um, uh, a bunch of developers working on it, you know, outside of the industry, so to speak, and, and it was tested by developers and users alike on um, a distribution, uh, an embedded distribution, right. as opposed to something that you know, um, you know, um, maybe uh, you know, one of the you know, may, one of the major manufacturers decides, oh, hey, we're gonna, add, you know, we're gonna add this feature or we're gonna develop this feature. They, it's not them who are working on it. Um, and a lot of times, even like even when we credit, um, you know, we credit, we might credit Qualcomm. Oh, here's a good example, um, another great example. We might credit Qualcomm with the release of, um, for example, ATH nine K HGC firmware. Yeah, good job, Qualcomm. What's that? Good job, Qualcomm. Yeah, well, right. You're, now you're saying good job, Qualcomm, but really, it wasn't Qualcomm who did that. It was the people. There, there were two. There were two people within Qualcomm who did that. But Qualcomm itself, they could have cared less. Um, wait, wait a, wait a second. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. Okay. I, all right. I, I feel like I feel like we're gonna get we're gonna get diverged from the the core topic really quickly here. Um, but the people working inside of a company kind of are the company. It's kind of like saying back when Stuart language was was working on file synchronization at canonical that he was not part of canonical and had nothing to do with what canonical was doing um so i mean it's i mean the people within the company kind of are the company i mean they're an organization of people working together for a common purpose right i mean that's it's not i mean yeah they might be also tinkering with something in their spare time but if they're you know what i'm saying i mean that they're part of the company the the, and, yeah. Okay. I, I I see where you're where you're coming from. Um, of course you do. I'm brilliant. Let's change the topic. So <laughs> I. 
I would like I, I, uh, the actual the actual pushing was not from with, it was not really from within the company. The pushing um, and the objectives uh, of the people who, who worked on it and and pushed for it were coming from outside the company. Um, even. Um, Qualcomm Atheros didn't didn't um, didn't even develop or make an effort to really develop the drivers until after they were reverse engineered for for their Wi-Fi chipsets. Lewis um, actually reverse the first drivers um, for the Atheros chips were reverse engineered by Lewis um, outside of the company. Um, it wasn't until after they got a lot of bad publicity and so on that Qualcomm even took um, took, took took them on and hired them. Um, so you know. Um, yeah, I, 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 I think I think to say that Qualcomm has an interest is it's more of a PR interest than uh, an interest in um, uh, more. Well, I guess I would say than a financial interest, and I, I think that's kind of where I'm where I'm trying to where I'm trying to okay. say. Okay, all right, no, no, that's 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 fair, man. Yeah, that's that's fair. That's fair. That's fair. I feel like I could have a debate with you on this for quite some time, but let's let's move this back to the core thing here. So you came up with a kind of a really good set of examples of, you know, using, uh, of developing in open source, a nice new set of features, say based on a, and testing it on uh, open WRT on a set of Linksys routers, right? You, you can't, that's a really good example. Now, are you saying that the new rules would make it so that that was impossible to do impossible to put open WRT onto uh, router type equipment at all and make it so we couldn't test those new features, just completely annihilating that possibility? So, yeah, I mean, we should back up a moment because, you know, what is possible and isn't possible isn't so much, I guess, with that, with that issue. It, I mean, yeah, sure, we can break the law and, you know, you can get $100 of equipment and, and flash the chip directly and you can probably get around these restrictions the way they're being now, implemented. Yeah. No, no, no. no are, are, the, are the laws, and, you know, I, I haven't read the laws in detail. I've just kind of read the synopsis. So you and, and Jeremy, I think, are going to be a little bit more of the experts here. So I want to pose this question to you. Is it, are we talking more uh, about the ability for companies to ship the products in a certain way, or are we talking more about the inability uh, in the illegality of end users to modify the hardware sort of like, um, you know, flashing a, a firmware on an iPhone debate. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's kind of a, it's kind of a mix of both. So, so manufacturers won't be allowed to ship in a state that enable or does not prevent the user from loading other firmware. Okay. Um, so that, that's, that's what the rules are, are basically that are being proposed. The, um, now whether or not you can get around it, yeah, you, you can probably, or at least, at least right now on most routers, um, and I'm going to use routers specifically because that's the most obvious, um, example. If we start applying these same rules to like, for example, and there's no, there's no reason to, as they are, there's no reason that they wouldn't apply to other devices as well. So like, for example, if we started applying these rules to computers, then all of a sudden you have hardware, um, and, and again, whether it's the best, phrased best, I think it's the best way to, for people to understand it. If we start talking about what the way things are implemented in computers as far as locking stuff down, you're looking at hard, basically like what I would describe as more of a hardware lock, and you can't just easily get around that. Um, whereas in the routers, there's not a hardware lock at this time. Sure. So you can bypass it if you have the technical know-how and, um, you know, you want to spend 100 bucks in equipment to, you know, directly flash the chip. Um, that you can get you can get around it, but again, you would be breaking the, the these rules, and doing so actually um, subjects both the user um, and uh, the, the the company who is selling the device uh, to twenty. To, um, I believe it was a uh, twenty thousand up to twenty thousand dollar fine per device. So. This is not something you want to just ignore. Well, the fine would only ever apply to the manufacturer, right? Because the end user would never be an FCC licensee, and the FCC only has control over directly licensed. The, the, the FCC has no right to issue a civil penalty at all. Um, yeah, that's not that's, that's not my understanding. Um, they've, the, they've... You have to be a licensee for them to even apply to you. So this rule, even if it's a badly written rule and goes through, would still only apply to manufacturers. That's almost the worst thing, though, right? I mean, yeah, if, if, saying, it actually right, applied, it's, if the FCC... The FCC could, has absolutely no civil authority. 
if they could find users, then it wouldn't be a problem. You just say, go ahead, load whatever firmware you want on these on these devices. <laughs> if you overdrive the radio outside the required bands, then the FCC will then come out and fault. beat you yeah. up, and then it wouldn't be a problem. The fact that the FCC only applies to manufacturers means that all they can do is influence the manufacturers to not allow end users to do this, right? So that's worse. <laughs> I want to I want to add something here because that's not my understanding of it. Um, from what I've been being told by lawyers and others, um, that the FCC can go after end users, and they have, and also something. No, no shit, they can handle. Right. Yeah, and I'm. Oh, dude, are you getting corrected in the background? That is epic. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Not being corrected. He's 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 agreeing with me. Um, oh man, I was hoping you were being corrected. It's funnier that way. That's well, what an FCC right. rule only right, applies so to the up. licensee. So uh, uh, because an end user would never be the licensee, that particular depending on the rule, you, you could go over like a DMCA thing or something else. But the FCC rule itself could not be applied to end users. It's just not. Here's here's what one of the lawyers basically said to me. If you modify the firmware, you become uh, you you you're tech, I guess you're technically required to get a new license or something like that. Um, so um, so like okay, for example, um, and and maybe maybe my interpretation maybe it's possible maybe my interpretation of what the lawyer said is wrong. Um, but um, for example, if you are let's say you're you're, you're a coffee shop, right, and you uh, third, flash third-party firmware onto the device, you become a- affected by the rules, um, and you have to comply with them. And if you then end up... I think you're, you might have conflated two different things. Let's say you flash a third-party firmware, and then let's say you're in the U.S., you, you enable Channel 14. The fact that you enable Channel 14 means you're breaking an existing law, but that has nothing to do with the FCC at all. That's a separate, already existing law that you're not supposed to be so right. i guess my my a further question because i know we're running a little short on time here is i think we all agree that interfering with airport radar is one example is something that does genuinely need to not happen so what would your per- yeah, yeah. as the save wi-fi kind of guy what rule would you propose that would be the sweet spot where technology enthusiasts would have the right to do what they want with their hardware but uh you know, airplanes yeah. can land safely which i think is that can you be safe yeah. you, you need to acknowledge that there is an actual issue that they're trying to address. So what would you consider the right uh, fix? Yeah, so we've actually, we've already got actually um, a set of um, uh, rules uh, that uh, basically, um, or, or uh, how do I say this? It's, 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 there's, already, there's already basically uh, an understanding amongst the people uh, who are working on um, these, uh, the, these free firmwares that, they don't enable um, user interfaces or default settings that would enable the user to accidentally um, violate the rules. the 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 rules are the rules are basically that are causing problems are basically being um, caused by people who are going in or uh, you know it's it's uh, I guess I guess I think it was a company or something to that effect that went in and they they basically changed the um, the firmware around so that they could violate the rules and they could and they can be gone after um, you know with fine. And, and so on, and they actually have been. Um, you can look up the cases um, yourself, and, and but, they have. But been hang fine. on a second. <clears throat> so, but that that solution there is essentially obfuscating the interface for someone to to potentially break the rules. It's preventing the ability for people to accidentally trip into into breaking the rules. But I would imagine that the majority. You know, we're not talking about you know clicking on the wrong button in an iPhone here. We're talking about a fairly deep level of technical expertise required to even just flash the firmware. So I would imagine that the kind of people who do want to break the rules are doing it intentionally, and the goal of these FCC guidelines is to block uh, at the hardware level the people the ability for people to to load yeah. software that will break the rules. So I I, yeah, I, I so- get the point of what you've just said. But that it's, doesn't go anywhere near I, close to. Pro- it, I mean, it's excessive. What, what, how- I mean, so the argument, I think, the argument is basically that it's excessive. That we're we're pretty much uh, um, we're agreeing uh, to the fact that we believe it's to be these rules are to be excessive. Um, the, it, you don't necessarily there are there there may be ways um, to to. Um, uh, implement a system that would work such that you couldn 't change the uh, the settings uh, to violate the rules without locking the whole devices down, 
but it's it, it, there's a more um, there would be need to be much more discussion about it and but, uh, proposals but, and more conversations with the FCC. But I guess uh, in order to make I guess that that's happen. where I where I don't understand them, and please correct me where I'm, I'm yeah. almost certainly wrong. Is it strikes me that the thrust that's of true. what you're trying to accomplish here it reminds me a lot of back in the days of like Bunny Huang and the Xbox when he was hacking the Xbox and this notion that if I if I viol- if I basically void my warranty I should be able to do whatever I want with the hardware and it's, it kind of reminds me back of those days right but we're not just talking about running linux on an xbox we're talking about people being potentially able to 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 have you know to, to to write code that has potentially quite dire consequences in some situations so i guess w- w- where i'm where i'm what i'm failing to understand here is it sounds like the only pe- it sounds like what you essentially want here is the ability the, the the freedom that you want to protect here is by definition the ability for people to run their own firmware and there is no way, at least as far as I'm aware, there is no way to let people run their own firmware and restrict certain channels. Like, surely well, if they were, you'd if have they to turn it into like a phone situation where there's a baseband that controls ba- the yeah, radio exactly. channels and stuff like that. Right. Which th- then the baseband would be closed. There are potentially there are potentially ways to do it. Um, where uh, I, and again, I'm, I honestly I can't really give you any details on it. Um, but this has been discussed by by uh, major people in Qualcomm and Qualcomm and software developers uh, working on this stuff. There is potentially a way to do this, um, but it's it's you know it's more complicated and there would be there would need so the SEC would have to put um they, they basically have to be in discussion with how this could be done and still comply with the rules um and, and that's basically that's basically one of the reasons there's not anybody there's not going to be there's not any propose there's not any so we're not trying to propose a solution to the problem um because we don't have enough information to propose a solution to the problem because the fcc needs to communicate better what exactly its intent are we are actually um in part making assumptions and it, it's been stated as fact that this is a reaction to um uh, you know, the, for example, the, the Doppler weather radar thing and, and, and so on. But we actually don't know that. The FCC hasn't come out and said that. Um, the, it's, um, it, 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 people have made the, 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 connected the dots, but it's, it's not, um, it, it's not, it's not, there's, there's no factual statement that I've ever seen from the FCC stating that. Okay. And there's been some double talk and, and some other stuff from the FCC. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's, um, more, more communication needs to happen. Um, and we're, we're trying to do that. Um, but again, it's, it's, um, uh, we, we do, there's, um, there's questions that are going to be asked <laughs> between the meeting, um, of the, the Save Wi Fi basically coalition and, um, and the FCC, but it's, it's still a work in progress. All right, that's, uh, we're gonna, that's, that's I think all we're gonna fair. have to we're gonna have to wrap this up because we're going a, a little bit longer than we normally do. But I think this is a topic that is definitely very important for those of you who do want to make a comment to the FCC. The comment section is then extended because of uh, some system maintenance they were doing it, so it closes on October 9th now. And I think this is a conversation that I would like to get a little bit more involved with and, and to have extended beyond the show. So head over to community.badvoltage.org, and we'll continue to the discussion there because I think there is still a lot to say, and hopefully we can convince an FCC that's been on really an uncharacteristically pro-consumer tear to, to keep that uh, momentum going. Yeah, I, I should also I should also point out real quick. Um, there's there's a lot of um, errors in a lot of articles that are out. Things is not an issue. Um, there's a, the, the, there's factual errors, and some of the quotes are from people who didn't actually know what they were talking about. So I would definitely encourage people if if they, if they have any questions or they think it's cool. not an issue, um, get on the mailing list on the um, Save Wi-Fi uh, dot org mailing list and um, go there and, and and ask us because there's yeah it's there's a lot of misinformation right now that we're trying to correct. That sounds that. great. Sounds and good. Chris, Thanks, if, Lectures, if, I appreciate if our, uh, it. <clears throat> If our community posts some some questions to the forum, do you, do you mind swinging by and uh, and and sharing your insight with them? Um, yeah, I can do that. Can, if you send me a link, yeah. Sure. If we send you a link, it's badvoltage dot org. <laughs> Just click on the community button at the top of the page, my good man. <laughs> that, that works too. I'll send you a link. That works too. All right. Th- I, I, I thanks so much, sure Chris. Was, but okay. Sounds we really good? appreciate time. All right. Take care. <laughs> As a gadget-loving technology enthusiast, I'm always on the lookout for something new and interesting. And if it has a DIY component, even better. Enter Android Home Mirror. No, this isn't a project to mirror your home screen to some other device. 
It's an open source project that will help you turn an old Android tablet and a two-way mirror into one of those cool displays that you see at a high-end hotel or sports bar where what is being shown looks like it's actually in the mirror. Basically, you create this by covering the back of the two-way mirror with black backing, cutting out a spot the size of the tablet, and then adhering the tablet to the mirror. The software then allows you to show a wide variety of things including the date, time, weather, stock prices, and even the latest XKCD. It's pretty cool. Unfortunately, obtaining a two-way mirror in the size I desired proved to be much more difficult than I anticipated, so I haven't actually completed this project yet, but I do intend to. If you've done anything like this, head over to community.badvoltage.org and let us know. So as Jano mentioned in the uh, segment about Mycroft, we talked about home automation a little bit in the last show, and people in the forum seemed to be pretty interested on the topic, so we figured we would turn it into a follow-up segment on this show. Now, the Mycroft itself kind of plugs into home automation in that it works with the Nest, I think it works with the Wemo from Belkin, it works with the Hue and the Samsung Smart Things and a couple other things, although it doesn't itself have ZigBee or Z-Wave controllers or anything like that. So back to home automation, I don't know how of the three of you guys, if you have any other home automation stuff, I've, I've been trying to slowly build up my home in the home automation direction. So I know I have quite a few opinions on this. I don't know. Where, where are you guys in the, in the home automation spectrum? You think it's a good idea, bad idea? I, I've nope, just got the security, far. like the, the security, you know, the kind of integrated to your phone and TV security thing that is probably invading my privacy and listening to everything I do. I've got that. Um, but that's that's about it at this point. We have an uh, we have an alarm system, which is not really I mean, it, 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 I guess home it's, automation. It's, it's just a part of it. Yeah. I mean, there's but, right. There's sensors on the doors and stuff like that. And we have a couple of drop cams. But outside of that. We don't have anything, but I, I am definitely looking in, you know, as I mentioned in the last show, we, we went to a friend's house and saw his setup. <coughs> and um, I've been thinking about it quite a lot recently. If For two main reasons, it seems a lot less expensive than I thought. And secondly, uh, you don't have to do a bunch of rewiring. That was the major thing that put me off is I don't want to, mm. I don't, well, it's not that I'm going to do it. I don't want to have to pay somebody to come in and rewire yeah. my house. <laughs> let's be, let's uh, be clear here. <laughs> John is not going to do no it. No way I'm doing it. Yeah. It took two years for me to mount a surround sound speaker. I was going to say, I'm just thinking about the surround sound speaker stuff in your house. I, I went, I went to America, um, stayed with Jono and Erica, and Erica said, "Hey, you know what you could do? You could hassle Jono to put up the surround sound system." And I went, "Okay, no problem." Mentioned it, he didn't do it. I went back two years later, and he still hadn't done it. it was terrible. <laughs> um, I, I, I am, I am a guy where to turn on the television in my living room, you have to press a button on the front of the television. So. <laughs> Home automation I haven't <laughs> quite embraced yet, but I'm interested in it, wow. con- unless Chromecasts count, but I'm interested in it conceptually. Okay. So, so, I mean, that's, so I think we're at an interesting point. What's, what's good? Right, I think we're at an Is interesting point like gadget in fever? home automation stuff, because right, you have the old school, like M-Control and Control 4 and Creston, the old school ones, they've been around for decades. It is mostly, like John said, hardwired. Typically, an alarm panel is your interface, and it's typically a terrible, terrible interface, although they're getting better. And now you have a bunch of open source, cool kind of control panels, like the o- Open HAB, which I mentioned last show, and there's Open Remote, there's Home Genie, there's Demotics, there's a mm. whole bunch of them. And then there's some other stuff like Samsung with the smart things where it's trying to plug into a bunch of different things. And I mean, even Staple and Lowe's have their own product lines now getting into this. So it's definitely becoming something more mainstream and, and more prevalent. As I get into it more, I think the one frustrating thing has been it's a bunch of we're, we're at the curve in this where it's a bunch of walled gardens. Right. So there's a bunch of products that work yeah. right together that don't work with any other <laughs> products. And while the smart things and some other stuff, the Wink, for example, try to get rid of that, you still have, especially when you're first getting into it, do you want Z-Wave or Insteon or just regular Wi-Fi IP or Zigbee or there's like some of the old stuff's just 400 megahertz. There's Lutron, there's Bluetooth, there's Thread and Weave if you go with, with some of the Google stuff now and Nest. So there's a whole bunch of buzzwords and a whole bunch of products that work great individually and terribly together. That sucks. So I think... In three or four years, it's going to be an awesome landscape, and we'll get to the point where everything's interoperable. We're just not there yet, and that's been at least my biggest frustration. So I have a whole bunch of stuff that 
I have to set up individually and have a bunch of different bridges and a bunch of different things everywhere. That So I have to open a bunch of different apps to do different things, depending on what I want to get done. Hey, Jeremy, is there anything it's, like it's, like the Mycroft for, say, you know, thermostat regulation and whatnot? Is there like an open hardware, open source based one that even if it doesn't communicate using the same protocols as everything else, is there like an open version of, of a lot of these home automation systems? So the actual hub wise, yes. Like the, like I said, the open HAB, open remote, home genie, all those are open source and they can talk to many devices, including a nest or including, uh, you know, my HVA system came with the old train that was Z wave and I've, I've okay. since replaced it with a nest. So you can so control you use, through that. You use I, the hubs to communicate of, with a bunch of proprietary systems. And then you all go into the hub and the hub is kind of the one that you inter- interact with, right? Correct. But the problem is some products only work with some hubs. So I have multiple <laughs> hubs and for multiple protocols and multiple products, which is <laughs> that's annoying. a pain in the ass. <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's, it's I'm, not a clean setup, but I started I'm, a few years ago, so it's gotten better, but is getting better at an accelerating rate now, I would say. And more importantly, not only is it a pain in the ass, but this does not make, you know, actual people or people who are just getting into this field. They don't think, oh, in that case, I need to get this hub and then this hub, and then they'll talk together. You just go... Well, none of it works, sod off. Or worse, they go, well, in that case, the way to solve this is to just buy everything from one company, at which point they're then locked in forever, right? Which obviously the companies right. want, but we really don't. Right. I mean, the nice thing is... Like, yeah, I mean, it's... Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, it's. Um, it seems like it's very... It, it's kind of like the software wars from years ago, right? Is that, you know, you get these companies who are invariably wanting to create their own their own system that you have to buy all the different pieces from there right um and i haven't looked into it in any great level of detail but question i have for you jeremy you seem to be definitely the have the most expertise here are there some like standards are there any standards that are in development to make all of these different bits talk to it together because i've heard people talk about z-wave is that is that so z-wave and zigbee are going to be the two most popular now and, and thread is from nest is really just a zigbee plus something else kind of protocol so i'm gonna I be honest you're, zigbee you're is gonna the best end name. up i think that should be the standard because it's <laughs> Z- way zigbee cooler sounding than z-wave the best name it sounds um, like a cartoon dog but um, I, part I think of the most zigbee things are gonna is... go why is zigbee better now you, yeah now you no, know i'm i'm joke. wrapped for attention redheaded dude from england <laughs> nah, why, why is zigbee same. better that's precisely the point because otherwise if if you work with the other one then you spend all your time over here calling it z wave and nobody understands what you're talking about so you have to call it (laughs) good call man there it is most of the hubs now support z wave and zigbee and wi-fi so between those three those three are probably going to be the way forward and a lot of the other stuff i would so a couple of things here um yes on that particular level and that's the the actual communications radio layer right yeah i'm short of vocab here but bear with me um but then on top of that just because you've got two zigbee devices that doesn't necessarily mean that they can communicate right each of them needs to kind of provide an api that's like saying oh i've got two things they both talk wireless therefore they are compatible and you're like well not really (laughs) because but right it's it's one of those things not really so a thing like the smart or the smart things hub will support the vast majority of devices Hmm. Because is that's that because, how they're selling it. Is that because devices are offering common APIs? Like, so if if you if your smart things hub can talk to all the thermometers on the market, is that because they're all offering the standard thermometer API, or because the hub just knows about six hundred and twenty two different thermometer? Devices? No. So from what from what I can tell, the thermostats are a good example of it has to be explicitly supported, and they all seem to be different. Where something oh, like gotcha. a light bulb it seems to be pretty sake. standard that it's gotcha. <laughs> Why is it, it that every most company in the world does? I mean, we'll call this the Sony problem, right? Where you invent a new product, you go, hey, here's a thing. There could, we could have a world where everyone in the world wants to buy one of these and they all buy it from us. So therefore, we'll do, we'll be completely incompatible. And then five years from now, they'll all go, I'll tell you what, let's get together and form a consortium and call it the Open Smart Home Things Alliance or something. And nobody ever learns and just goes, let's do that from day one. What? By the way, it is shocking uh, how often this industry oh, goes through that exact iteration. 
this does sound like a, a pretty good idea. Uh, so, so here's, so I keep coming, I keep thinking this over Shut and over up. again. Like we're we're super stoked about about like things like the Mycroft, and part of why we're super stoked is it's it's open in like every possible way you can look at it. Right? It's flexible. It's open source. It's open hardware, and that makes it awesome. And I like that there's a there is some open standards and open source going on with with a lot of this home automation stuff. But it kind of like are there open source and open hardware options for you know the smoke detectors and the thermostats and 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 all the pieces and parts that you add in or in order to get that functionality currently do you really have to grab something proprietary from some company that uses some bass backwards protocol that you then have to use a an, an open platform to kind of like hack into it in order to make it work i mean it's it feels it feels dirtying to me and, and i i know it's not going to be to most people but but for us, I feel like it matters. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. And on the hardware side, it is definitely not very open, uh, especially on the peripheral side. The, the hub, like I said, you can kind of make do. But uh, on the on the device side, there's almost no open things, unless you're willing to take a Raspberry Pi and build it yourself or something like that. Well, which, I guess that's But there's true. no off-the-shelf open hardware kind of stuff. Well, I, and I'm guessing that a big, a big chunk of this is that it's just so early in the game, right? And the difficulty with... I mean, I think... There is always going to be certain things that stand in the way of of people experimenting with various technologies, and one of the challenges with this, I suspect, is that a lot of people probably still think I, that you have to rewire your house to to fill around with it. And I so as, profoundly as they, as they disagree easier, with the stance you're going down right now, Jono. The early in the game thing that's suggesting that in order to be innovative, in order to be early in the game, you've got to be proprietary and closed down and locked down. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying at all. No, that's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is, I think if you look at a lot of industries, they invariably start out proprietary yes. earlier in the game, and then as people get interested in it and it attracts the attention of open source people, there is more of a pressure on on. A, you know just look at drones the very first drones invariably like things like the dji drones that's true you're, you're right on that you're right proprietary on that. and then you see some more open and, and the same thing with software so i think it, it my theory, theory is that in the next five years <coughs> it'll become much more open source because there'll be more people interested in it and they will demand that right um, and open but, standard okay. as well which is also important but, it won't just be open yeah, source. i so guess be, what th- i'm things need to be at. more interoperable for this to be truly useful to the average person i think yes yes yeah, uh, yeah. i guess i guess what wow. i'm getting at is we're super stoked about my Minecraft, right i almost called it minecraft I, my, my daughter's playing way too much minecraft and i say the word minecraft 87 million friggin' times a day and so now i can't say the word mycroft even though it's a cool <laughs> name um but so we're super stoked about that it seems like They've proven that people can sit down with a Pi, sit down with an Arduino kit, sit down with a bunch of, of, of commodity parts that people can pick up and create some amazing things like this. It just seems like they've proven that there's an opportunity there and an interest in people to fund things like a, a, a thermostat, um, um, a whole series of little pieces and parts, smoke detectors, home automation systems, uh, the equivalent of drop cams using a lot of these same parts. And, and there are people that are going to support that. And I'm hopeful well, that people will look yeah, at that and, yes. and peop- these, these maker communities will pull together and start producing these things um, a little bit more often so that I can get behind them so that I can put them in here. Cause I have this, I have the security system here, and it's through Xfinity and or Comcast or whatever the hell company name they are now. And I I hate that it's so integrated with their systems. I hate it. It isn't a bad service. Well, they the do a th- good thing. But I want an open system. I want a system that I can control, that I can feel more secure with. And so that's why I haven't gotten more into the home automation, because I'm not comfortable with it. I'm not comfortable with eight different well, the companies thing is, producing is, these think- pieces and parts that are proprietary. The th- I, th- I think the, the the much as we all love the Mycroft, I I wouldn't go so far as to say that it's demonstrated demand because they, they've raised a relatively small amount of money. There's a certain amount of eyeballs on the internet that have got money behind them that 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 will fund certain Kickstarter projects. Yes, and I would say that what they basically reached out to a certain demographic, which is that demographic is us. It's us, and they. And you know they did a decent job. They by no means. I mean, this was not like the coolest we're, cooler. We're not talking millions of dollars. We're not talking about needing but, to but demonstrate the, demand for a billion people. We're talking about needing to demonstrate no, demand enough no. for a tiny mom and pop company to produce a cool one-off piece of hardware like the micro. But what I'm saying is that. But what I'm saying is that 
the open source nature of it, while it's we all know that it's better for building products, is not most consumers don't give a shit about that, right? They don't care about that. So the only way in which open source and open hardware is going to really percolate into the wider mainstream is through great products. Like the, the Amazon Echo is a good example. If the Amazon Echo is good, and I don't know if it is good, if it is good... It is actually kind of cool. <laughs> and if it, and if, it was, if it was built on open source, open hardware, then that would do a far better job of, of, of raising awareness in the world, even if it didn't come from Amazon. Um, so oh, what, well, you're, what you're saying is, is if the Minecraft is, is, is good, here. it does a good job of raising awareness. That that That's exactly the point, that here we have a, literally a, a natural lab experiment because Minecraft is basically doing the same thing as the Amazon Echo is, um, but it's all built with open source. If the, if the Minecraft ends up being better than Amazon Echo, then that's potentially yes. rung one on the ladder to people saying, look, you yeah, can, as definitely. Brian said, build a small mum and dad company. It doesn't sound right in English. Um, a small company um, building, I don't know, uh, thermometers yeah. with a Raspberry Pi inside. And if you only sell 1,500 of them, which is, you know, all that Minecraft's done, then doesn't matter. doesn't matter. It's enough. Yeah. Because it's still viable. I, it's still viable. Yeah. I agree. My, my only point is the selling point the, a reasonable chunk of the selling point for the Minecraft Kickstarter campaign was the open source, open hardware nature of it. Right. And I mean, we already said earlier in the show, that's the reason why three of us backed it. That's one of the major reasons why three of us backed it. Um, Come on. The, you liked its cute but, face too. But the, the face is very you, cute. You like uh, the cute the, face. Most don't, people are, don't try and downplay it, Jono. I see the face you're making all right, right now. I really, you make the I, same I really face like as when you face. see a cute little kitten. You love the cute stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I do actually. That's, uh, yeah, you're you're completely right. But the thing is, they've got to start with a great product, and then the open stuff has got to be with that. So you know, uh, irrespective, though, I think that we're going to head in that direction with the, the with the home automation stuff. I'm almost all the smart home stuff. I'm almost certain of it. So so, so bear me right. Um, Jeremy has already basically turned his place into the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> but the the other um the other two of you. Um, are you interested enough to actually start buying more yes. of this stuff? Unequivocally. Yeah, I'm going to do it. Yes, definitely. Gonna without do a it. doubt. Right, so so we're going to have reviews for the next five years of Bad Voltage then as one of you buy some kind of internet controllable well, donut. No, here's, here's the thing. This is why I, 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 I'm bringing this up and harping on this. I, I would like to put out a call, and we've already said, hey, go to our forums enough times in this in this show episode already. So I'm not going to tell you to go to the forums, but find a way to communicate with us that other people can read that happens to be on badvoltage.org. And if anyone has information <laughs> relating to how do we put together an open source, open hardware thermostat, even if it's, you know, buy these five or six parts with here's the quick how to of how to put it together, or here's a company that makes most of it and you just need these extra parts to, to go the extra mile and get it hooked up with your, your home automation system and not just thermostats, but you know, all the different pieces and parts. I would love to hear about it. Even if it's half baked, even if it's not all the way there, because I know there's yeah. gotta be projects, these little, little small maker projects, like what the Mycroft started as that could use the extra yeah. attention that could use the extra help to become an actual product that I can buy without having to put it together because I'm so goddamn lazy. And I really want to get to that point because I want to buy these parts, but I'm not willing to do it if it's all closed source. So I need your guys' help. And if we got those, if, if, you guys know of those parts. I will get them. I'll hook them up and we'll see how the hell they work and we'll review them on the show and we'll give them some attention if they deserve it. Cause I think, I think that's profoundly yeah. important. I feel like this is like one of the next yeah, great frontiers for open source and open hardware is all this home automation yeah, totally. stuff. Totally. I think we all agree on that. And so we, we just need to support those projects. So if you have any information, any ideas, add it into some unnamed nebulous place where you can add this sort of information on bad voltage.org and that would help out tremendously and i think just to underscore brian saying it is so important because the home automation stuff in general it, there's presence detectors everywhere it knows when you're home it knows when you're not home there's potentially cameras involved there's so much of your data wrapped up in a home automation system that making sure that data is protected in a sane way is so important that it, it just it needs to happen
About three years ago, I went to London to the canonical office, and one of my colleagues, Chris Canning, was stood up working at his desk. There was no chair and instead an awkward-looking long stand for his monitors and keyboard. When I inquired, I was informed that this was a standing desk and that sitting is the new smoking. For the next three years, I remained pretty cynical about standing desks. I thought of them as some new-age, vegan, gluten-free office nonsense until I saw them cropping up more and more. After a little reading about the health benefits, I decided to invest in a cheap desk to give it a shot myself. This is where things got difficult. It turns out that most standing desks are ridiculously expensive, many of which were over $350 on Amazon. Not good for trying this standing lark out. After, ex after extensive research, though, I discovered the Lyft Standing Desk Conversion Kit for $150. Like many, I didn't really need an entire desk. What I needed was something to go on my existing desk that raises up my monitors, keyboard and mouse to a comfortable level. This is what this conversion kit does. The lift kit is pretty simple. It includes the main desk, which is adjustable to different heights and can fit two smaller monitors or one large monitor on it. The main desk also has a shelf under it, which you can put other equipment on. I've got my PS4 and some books on there. The lift kit also comes with a companion stand for the keyboard and mouse. This provides plenty of room for the keyboard and a little side plate that the mouse goes on. This is also adjustable to your desired height. Quality-wise, the lift kit is of reasonable quality. The desk feels pretty rugged, but the keyboard and mouse stand is a little flimsy. Adjusting the height on the main desk is simple, and the adjustment on the keyboard and mouse stand are very flexible, if a little tricky to get right. Fortunately, you only need to do this once. Overall, I'm pretty happy with the lift kit, and my standing desk experiment actually stuck. I love standing at my desk, and it gives me a greater level of alertness compared to sitting on my arse all day in my seat. One tip though, be sure to go out and get a comfortable mat to stand on. This is not optional. You will screw your back up if you're not careful. I plumped for the anti-fatigue mat by Sky Mats, which was $68 on Amazon, and it works great, even under barefoot. So what is the bad voltage verdict? If you want a decent quality, flexible, and comparatively cheap standing desk conversion kit, the lift is a solid choice. Just be sure to get a mat. Trust me, get a mat. Okay, so there were two things we need to be clear about here. First of all, Get you, a mat. you thought of this as some new age vegan gluten free office nonsense until you decided that you actually like new age vegan <laughs> gluten free nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> well, he did you move to California. Yes, so that's... Um, but secondly, and more importantly, the Lyft <laughs> standing desk conversion kit, which means as far so instead of buying a standing desk, what you did was you spent $150 on a box and then put yeah. your laptop yeah. on yeah. top. This is like the, the fancy version of getting like a bunch of like ca crates, a can those like 24 cases of beer to put your TV on when you're in college. Exactly. This is pretty much the same thing. Yes. <laughs> I will well, say, when you said you were reviewing a standing I, desk, I was quite happy about it because I've been kind of considering getting one because they're kind of, ex but they're kind of expensive. Yeah. And th that's not at all what I thought you were going to review. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, it's funny because, because, yeah, because I, I think most people are looking to get more of a conversion kit than an actual desk because most people have got a desk already and they want right. to convert it and they want to try it out. I mean, when I started out uh, experiment, what I did mention in the review was I actually, one of the tallest surfaces in our house is uh, our downstairs uh, like kitchen countertop. And actually what I did to start out was I just put a little suitcase on there and experiment and just type it into my laptop and it seemed to work reasonably well. But then, so when I actually got the kit, it seems, you know, it's much better because you can adjust the, like the, the monitor is a little bit taller yeah. than, the, than the keyboard, for example. Um, but it, it is, yeah, it is, it is a conversion kit. But I think most people want that. I don't think people want to throw their desks away. I think they just want to, what? to get the kit. And the other thing which I didn't mention in the review was I was originally wrestling with the very desk, which is one that you can have in a, in a position where you can sit at it and then you can move a lever and it'll move it into a standing position. Yeah. And I was, but they're like $350. And Erica said to me, she was like, if you just want to sit down, You've got a laptop. Just sit down on, on the chair with a laptop. So the, the bear <laughs> desk and the, the Ergotron point. are kind of the two popular. They're about 350 bucks, yeah. and they turn it. But I think, it, at least for me, I'm at my desk and my computer so often that I have it set up in a way that I really like. So having a standing and right. sitting at my same area to me is appealing. Yes. So I, I don't want to stand right, all day, right. but I also don't want to sit all day. I mean, as much as I'm pretty active and, and do a lot of running and other stuff, I sit a lot because I work 
a lot. Right. So that's why one of the yeah. standing sitting ones really is appealing to me. Um, yeah. But the more yeah. research I did, like the, the nice one, like the next desk or the steel case makes the air touch, which looks nice. What all that said and done, nice. when you load them up, they're about two grand, which I'm not spending this two is grand it, on a desk. Man. You get this thing which unfolds like Optimus frigging Prime and costs you a thousand dollars. You think? Well, th- really? So there's two new the, the Ergo de- the Ergo Depot Jarvis and what was the other yeah. one? God, that's the such Evo a great desk. name for a desk. Both they both are <laughs> both are funny names, but they are, they're both motorized. They both have memories. They both look fairly well constructed, and they're about six to seven hundred dollars. So they are coming to a price that i would consider spending no that's yeah. in the range that isn't yeah. absurd i mean yeah and importantly now the the other point about this is apparently john you're, you're now miles out of date granddad because the cool thing is a leaning desk what? now standing I desks are old hat you need a lean the kneeling the desk is also quite desk. popular now what? Well, you know what, what when you, lean the, um, on? Uh, you, you, you remember the bit where they bring in uh, Hannibal Lecter and he's on that kind of hand track what? thing. Apparently, you get, what, you the leaning desk you kind of stand in that position, so it's like you're standing up by and then you kind of tilt backwards and then type. It's nuts. So you, right? so you, you got people going so you leaning desk. Did you see the kneeling desk as well? It looks so uncomfortable. I, I, well, and, and people sit on those big inflatable balls as well, which is just ridiculous. Hey, <laughs> hey so do not. I think I have a million dollars. I think I have a million dollar idea awesome. here, and I just I just thought about it on the show. So if someone wants to kickstart this, I, I, my fees are very modest. I want a downward dog desk <laughs> where you have to do a down, yoga downward dog pose, and that's the only way you can type. What the hell is it? What the hell is a downward oh dog? Oh my god! It's, it's a it's yoga. A, it's one basically one a basic yoga pose. So, yeah, it's when you start, when you're an old. Don't, horse, don't look so at me. I, 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 I'm not bothered that sitting's the new smoking, so I'm still perfectly happy with the old smoking. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I do have two actual questions about yeah. your experience with this. One, b- before you did this, and I looked around, what I was kind of hoping to see was like a rigorous, statistically sound, ergonomic study about sitting and standing desks. Yeah. I could not find one. Uh, so, anecdotally, at least, how do you feel? Now that you have a mat, which seems very important, how do you feel after using one of these? Um, I, I I really like it. I mean the the one of the mistakes I made when I started was I basically stood up all the time, and people say like you 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 don't want to be stood all the time. You have to mix you know sitting and standing, which is another argument for getting something like a very desk. Yeah. Um, um, so now I have a bit more of a balance of, of the two. But the thing that I really like about the standing thing is. You know, particularly as I tend to listen to music, so it, it makes the the work environment feel a bit more active. Um, I don't know how to explain it, but you know, when I'm it, when you're at work and you're kind of doing a fairly mundane task, it's easy to kind of slump back into the back of your chair and just slowly your mental uh, att- your attention span tends to wander. Yeah, isn't it? Nice? Whereas I don't get that as much when I'm standing. Uh, so it's yeah. So it's uh, you know, overall, I, I really like it. And whenever I go to the office, uh, the XPRIZE office. Um, you know, we have these tall, like temporary working desks and, and I do it there as well. Um, but I, again, mix the, mix the two up. So I, you know, sure. I definitely like it. The, the, the reason why I hammered on the mat so much is that my first two weeks, I think it was that I was trying this, I didn't have a mat and I thought I'll be fine because I'm stood on carpet in my, in my no. office. Didn't work. Uh, no, I, and no. I started getting uh, a, a, a bit of so. anecdotal information here. I mean, I'm not doing it now, but in the previous house I was in, I tried doing the standing desk approach, not by buying a desk. I was thinking about it, but I did the same thing you did, John. I, I used the kitchen worktop and then put a pile of books on there or something like that. I forget exactly what, and stuck that out for a bit. And it becomes very apparent after like somewhere in between 15 minutes and two days that you need a mat. And they're not kidding about that. You know, it's yeah, it's yeah, kind of yeah. it's kind of the same thing for if you like do dishes or or do a lot of cooking at the stove. Like you need a big squishy thing to stand on in the kitchen too. You know, it, anytime you're doing <laughs> yeah. lots of standing, you need. So what we're saying is, bad voltage is taking the controversial topic of standing on something soft and squishy is more comfortable than standing on something that's not soft and squishy. That's 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 the takeaway I'm getting from this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know <laughs> the, ba- the bad voltage verdict on this is do it. Well, right. well here, here's the thing <laughs> I have. So, yeah. so okay. So in in my job, I you know I I do I sit down and I just kind of type all day, right? I just type all day and occasionally record a thing. There are certain, let's call them, 
biological and organic herbs that help with this 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 task of sitting down and <laughs> and being creative and typing all day. And I got to tell you, sitting okay. in a in a very comfy chair while you do it is kind of a mandatory thing because I think if I was standing that whole time, the possibility of gaining a concussion is high. Um, so I, I think I'm with Jeremy here. You need a convertible desk. Um, and I think I think. And I was thinking at first, motorized with memory convertible desk, that's over the top. But now that I'm thinking about it, there might be a state that you could get into, which would be a very productive state, um, where you'd want to be able to just push a button, sit, and go, what the hell's happening right now? And watch your whole desk slowly come down to your level, as opposed to needing to crank something or, or pull something up and down and, and set it. So I well, think, I think yeah. I, I, I'm getting to the point where, yeah, having a standing desk sounds preposterous to me, but a convertible standing up and down that sounds kind of rad surely you have to stand well, up to go is, get well, doritos anyway right? oh no no you well, absolutely is, don't well, is, but that's well, a completely different segment that would take me at least 15 minutes to get through and and you know to to i know we're gonna wrap this up pretty quickly but just i want to touch on the price point as well because th- i think this is an important thing when i was we buy almost everything from Amazon and Amazon's got a ton of different standing desks and other types of desks in there. And, uh, I was genuinely considering doing like some guy wrote a blog post, which was, he basically bought a table from Ikea and then nailed a shelf to it and, <laughs> and built his own, his own standing desk. <clears throat> and I was really considering doing that, but I wasn't sure how, how variable the height's going to be. I mean, I guess you could stand <laughs> it on books or whatever else. Um, but it was, it was astonishing to me how, most of the 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 most of the desks that you seem to be able to buy tend to be these conversion type things and they only have they they only have the desk for the monitors they don't have like a separate one for the keyboard and the mouse and i was i was blown away by how expensive these things were you look at it and you're like that's 30 dollars of materials and they're selling them for 200 bucks so in in the in the lift conversion kits defense $150, I think, is still too much money for what they're selling you. It really is. But it is a lot cheaper for what you get well, than most of the desks that being I've seen. And, t- and, the, and if you experiment. The phone book does come to your door for free. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it is a little bit crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but bear with me. And what you've got here is um, the lift. Uh, your monitor goes... <coughs> on a stand on the top because the, the desk that i was looking at when i was thinking about this your monitor attached to a kind of swingy monitor arm which seems like a better idea from my point of view but i'm really leery about the idea of getting my monitor and bolting it on one of these things in case it falls off in the middle of the night and breaks well, <laughs> one of the things i like about the desk approach is that you know i've got somewhere to put my coffee and and, and i've got yeah. like a little tray with usb sticks and stuff like that in it so hum- yeah, humanity so anyway, has been overall, using bolts think- for a very long time so i'm not sure that's a valid concern yeah yeah I- i've heard some <laughs> buildings use them with great success <laughs> Anyway, so as, as we wrap this up, uh, so though, yeah, overall, as I said, I am considering getting one of these. So if any of you listeners have any of the conver- conversion right. ones, whether it be the manual ones or the automatic ones or anyone who has one of the ones that's both, I would definitely like to hear from you. So do head to the forum and, and let us know. All right, there we are. We have another show in the can. Uh, thank you to uh, to Chris for joining us for the interview earlier on. I think it, he got a bit harder of a time than he was probably expecting. Yeah, he totally did. Um, you know, it's so it's so sad because we were talking about it beforehand, and we all kind of generally completely agree with what he's talking about. Yeah, exactly. And, and then he comes on the show, and we just just pull out the flogging paddle and just go at him. <laughs> But everyone's but completely well. on side, right? It is a bad thing if this happens, and we ought to stop it. <laughs> have right, have yeah. you... Um, you can go and fill in your comments, public comments, right? Have any of you done that? Hell no. I have not. Although we should probably put a link to it in the show notes, so that's... Yeah, actually, yeah. Let's yeah. do that. Uh, yeah. But I think you just link to <laughs> safewifi.org, right? And that gives you... Uh, that, I that think it's there, information yeah. about the thing yeah, itself sure. itself, which which just bounces to their wiki actually but yeah, I, I, we'll I, be I can't go about this... it because i'm not in the states but and we'll be able to live in yeah we'll be able to live in this brave new world where you can do absolutely anything on a router as long as you don't 
you know, talk to the wrong signals and, uh, you know, a, a, a router, the best of intentions. A, a router is something that, let's say, you use to, to carve chunks out of Shut wood. Up. Shut <laughs> up. No, it's Shut exactly up. the, the other way around. A router is the thing that carves things out of wood, and a router is the thing which roots I think actually packets. a router is a thing you use to uh, clean the poop out of a clogged pipe. I, I'm pretty sure. That's, That's a rooster, a, isn't it? That's a, a roto-rooter? <laughs> A rotor rooter. <laughs> anyway, yeah. so anyway, anyway, so next week, next week will be right kind along. of interesting. So next week is live voltage not next coming week, to you next live. Show, next Germany. show, next show, next show. To me, next weeks week. are really two weeks long. This is how it works in my brain. <laughs> Everyone knows this on the internet. They don't need clarification that my brain doesn't work quite right. The next episode in two weeks will be coming to you from Germany. So I believe the show will be a day late, maybe two days late. What? what what's yeah, we might be a couple, couple of days day, late because yeah. we record the show on the Wednesday um, and then we, we should ordinarily have the show the day after. But because we're going to be in Germany and you know a bunch of us are going to be flying back uh, and this is video as well. Uh, it may be delayed by right. it may come out on the Friday or the Saturday, but stay tuned. Uh, there'll be video for it. There'll be audio for it. We're looking forward to it. And get out there and see see the show. We still have so, some 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 limited. Yeah, seats say, this brings up a good point. If you don't want to have to listen to the show late. Your opportunity is to listen to it a day early by going to Fulda and actually seeing it live. Yeah, go yeah, to Fulda, so, Germany. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's your place show. now, people. If you're in or near Germany, I think that's a reasonable thing to ask of people. Fine, if you live in Buenos Aires, then you're probably not going to show up. But <laughs> go to yeah, Fulda so, in Germany. Um, um, all of Europe's connected now, so you can just drive there without having to fly. That's fine. Um, but go to badvoltage.org slash live and buy a ticket if you decide you want one. Wait, was yeah, there a time be great. In where Europe, you couldn't actually drive between countries at all, like recently? Not well, recently. Prehistoric times. Probably. Like prehistoric times. Yeah. Like, yeah. like, yeah. Not like war times, but like, it's, it's been like half a century, right? Since Actually, uh, I think, to be honest with you, not only in prehistoric times, what you had was you could drive from Europe to places that are now not connected to Europe. Right? right? I, th- I think that's true. So really, Europe is even less connected now than it ever was in the past. Yeah. You used to be able to drive to Europe, I love to like Europe Cincinnati or something, but not anymore. <laughs> I love Europe. It's like it's like the World Showcase at, at Epcot. Um, anyway, so um, we had an email from, from Super Engineer. <laughs> Super Engineer, I'm assuming is what that's short for. Not enough letters. Uh, Super Engineer says, please mess up another recording. Um, well, you know, careful what you wish for. Have Consider that done. Check. Uh, and <laughs> done. Check. We're there for you. Uh, Super Engineer says, please mess up another recording. Then perhaps we could be treated to the glorious fun that was the contest during episode 46, Box of Frogs. More bad voltage versification, perversifications, pretty please, and more punishments for the loser. Loving the shows. Thanks for each and every one of them. I actually want to use this as an opportunity for to ask our audience to tell us what you enjoy listening to because speaking personally i enjoy segments that have two main characteristics one is that it's some kind of silly contest and two is that the name is ridiculous oh god damn it uh, well, so, whereas unfort- unfortunately those. for El Baconio de Maximo, there is a moratorium on him naming segments so we're not going to have any more of those <laughs> This is this no, is this is the uh, Jono's right. Jono's yeah. right. I we we we've done a lot of weird stuff on this show. We've had poetry competitions. Basic. I mean, we've done poetry friggin' slams on a what is essentially a tech podcast. That's kind of ridiculous, right? So yeah. we would love to hear what you guys actually enjoy listening to. Do you want? Do you like the yeah. interviews? Do you like the tech segments? Do you like the political stuff? Do you like the contest? What do you like listening to? What do you think is the funnest? Let us know so that we actually do the right stuff, so we don't bore you to complete tears. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So let us know. Uh, show it uh, either on the forum at community.badvoltage.org or, you, or uh, like Super Engineer. Uh, you can send letters to us at, uh, or emails, as they're also known. <laughs> to, I found that way to, uh, than I kind of want to get a letter now. <laughs> to, I want a letter. Also to, accepting faxes. Sh- <laughs> <laughs> Address it to John if O'Bacon pay- behind the water pipes. <laughs> King's Cross Station, if you London. Could pages. Uh, Cross Station. Anyway, you can you can send emails to show it. Look, uh, look, what no! the fuck is happening? <laughs> I'm, Holy I'm God, saying, man! I'm For so God's so sake, man! It's ten years ago. The wheels are ago. coming off. I know, I know. Show a show bad, voltage. bad voltage dog. dog. <laughs> oh, anyway, all right. About, I think it's about time we wrap this up. Oh my this lord! Is, yes, I, well, this I, needs I, to be I done. Might actually, 
Done. I might fall over. I'm feeling quite sick right now. Hey, uh, hey so. I have to say, for a bloke who's off work, you don't look very sick. I'm thinking about ringing your boss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, Diamandus, he's calling in hooky. <laughs> he appears to be malingering, Mr. Diamandus. <laughs> hey, hey, guys. Why, Sounds good. Why do I do this? All right, let's go. Bye. That was the worst ending ever. <laughs> yeah, it sounds good. Recording. Brian is recording this. Jeremy is also One, recording. Two, three, three, three four, four, five, five six, six, seven, seven eight, 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 nine, nine, ten. ten. Hang on, I finished. Hang on, I'm going. Hang on. Eight, Brian's still eight. recording. This is the end of the show. <laughs> Nine. Why the hell do I do this every ten. two weeks with you people? <laughs> right. One, two, three, three four, four, five, five six, six, seven, seven eight, eight. It's not helping. <laughs> Language. Right. People, we're nowhere. Right. All right. All right. One, two, three, three, four, four five, five, six, seven, seven eight, eight, nine, nine ten. ten. <laughs> we nearly lost it then. Right. Consular professionals. Uh, sure. Go. Go for it.